Hello and welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Bill Hirschman, editor and chief critic for FloridaTheaterOnStage.com and your host tonight. Today's show is called Doing It All. But before we do it all, let me introduce our panel. We have Iris Acker, noted actress, writer, and the producer of this show. The award-winning Irene Agin, award-winning actress, and our South Florida equity liaison. And Michael McKeever, who is an actor, a playwright, and has a resume longer than your arm. <laughs> and our special guest today has an even longer resume. We are really honored to have Leroy Reams here as our guest to discuss doing it all. Can you tell us, do you do it all? I try. I try. <laughs> Anything that has to do with performing or the theater, I want to do. I don't really have a preference. As long as I can do the work and work with the people, it gives me great joy. You are, in fact, a director. You have a choreographer, an actor, a tap dancer. You do the dishes. <laughs> well, what happened when I was growing up as a little boy, I would get in the center of the room whenever there was music and I would dance and sing and carry on because I didn't come from a theatrical family, God knows. But my mother was smart enough to see what I was going to do, so she sent me to the local dance school where they taught tap toe ballet, acrobatic baton ballroom, <laughs> voice personality, and culture. That's what the sign said. <laughs> so that's how I started out, so I did everything all at once. That was your baton. Yes, okay. my, I, I did okay. All right. But then going through the process, of course, I was brought in to study, and then I attended the University of Cincinnati as a theater arts major, and I studied voice and had a dance scholarship at the College Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati. So I was lucky being geographically in the right place to be trained. And so then my junior year, College Conservatory of Music joined the faculty at the university, so all that transferred. And then the year I left, they had a musical theater major. I was never part of that. So, <laughs> but I had all of that training, so that's that's why I, I was very fortunate. And we well, were fortunate local. enough to grab you while you were here, way back when, when you were doing Hello Dolly. Yes. <laughs> so, so tell uh, us. That's that's the question everybody is going to want to know. How did it come about that you decided you wanted to do? Hello, Dolly. Well, first of all, I love the show. And uh, I'm fortunate enough that all the people who were connected with Hello, Dolly, David Merrick, Gower Champion, Carol Channing, Michael Stewart, I worked with doing 42nd Street. And then I had worked with Carol doing Lorelei. So I've had that association with all those creative people. And so uh, when I was doing Lorelei, with Carol Channing, I got a telephone call after the show had closed. A couple years later, she said, hello, Leroy, it's Carol. <laughs> Carol Channing, <laughs> like I would have known. <laughs> and I said, yes, Carol. She said, I'm going to do a production, a revival of Hello, Dolly, and I want you to play Cornelius Hackle, but Jerry Herman doesn't know you, darling, and Lucia Victor, the director, doesn't, so you have to come in and meet them, but don't worry, you got the job. <laughs> And so indeed I did, and that's where I began my relationship and friendship with Jerry. And we made Jerry, a, Jerry, Herman. Jerry Herman, and we made a close connection. And Jerry one day was telling me how he was a woman's writer. And I said, that's not true, Jerry. I said, I do all of your songs, and I disagree. I, I'm a man, and I love doing your songs. So then I started working with Jerry in concerts and stuff as a singer with him. So it made a very close friendship all these years. And of course, I was to have been the last uh, actor to play in La Cage aux Folles on Broadway because of my relationship with Jerry. And I left 42nd Street to do it, and I got in for a week's rehearsal, and they posted the closing notice. Wow. So one of those stories. But that, story. that relationship with Hello, Dolly, all those people involved. And uh, so then when I was doing La Cage down here. For the Wick. For the Wick. And Marilyn Wick, the producer, said, you must come back next season and do something. What would you like to do? I said, I would like to do Hello, Dolly. She said, oh, no, 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 I want you to be in the show. I don't want you to direct it. I said, no, I want to be in it. She said, you want to play Vandergelder? I said, no, I want to play Dolly. And so that's how it all happened. Wow. Now, I have to jump back a little bit because yeah. I was uh, directing a production of Hello, Dolly at the Muni in St. Louis. Yes. And uh, Louis Stadlin was playing Vandergelder and Randy Graff was playing Dolly. And while we were rehearsing, Randy went to the bathroom, and so Lewis turned to me and said, so when are you going to play this part? And I said, why, you think I can? He said, no, I know you can, and when you do, I'll play Van together. And I said, and I'll hold you to it. <laughs> so that's how all of that came 
to, to be, it came to fruition, was that conversation. So, and then when we did it, I told Lois, I said, well, now you're obligated, you have to do it. So that's, and also, I love the show. I love the content of what it says. I love the score. I mean, Jerry Herman is my favorite composer, lyricist. Mm -hmm. I knew Michael Stewart so well. Yeah, and I, nice. the unsung hero of so many musicals is the book writer. They never really get the credit they deserve, and Mike mm -hmm. did such a masterful job of transferring those wonderful, that wonderful play, Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder, into a musical. And uh, having worked with Mike on 42nd Street, I understand his sense of comedy and what he likes. So I was able to bring all of that experience into it, and of course, the close relationship with Carol. And having worked with Gower, so I have a great deal of love for the show itself. And that's why I want to bring that to the Florida audience. Which I you want did them very to see that the original concept, not to uh, to reinvent the show, to rediscover the show. So that's that's my main point. Well everybody who saw it <laughs> agrees that you succeeded in just what you wanted to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, let's go way back, finally, Roy. Way, way back. You talked about your living room. Well, you didn't spend much of your life there because after school, with this wonderful school, I attended one just like it. Mm -hmm. um, what was your first break? Well, I, as soon as I graduated from college, I went to Europe for a little brief vacation. Then I had to save some money to come to New York. So I had taken shorthand and typing in high school because I wanted to have a thing in case I couldn't work. Mm -hmm. Thank God I didn't have to use it because I worked for the piping contractor as a secretary. I screwed up his book so badly. <laughs> fired me. And then I was an English teacher, a substitute English teacher Whoa. in the Covington, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio school system. And I did that for three months because I couldn't sign a contract because as soon as I had enough money, I was going to New York. I saved $500. Boy, was I ready to go. <laughs> and my professor from school drove me to New York. And uh, I went to my first audition and my first job, which was dancing with Juliet Prowse in her nightclub act. Wow. That became my first job. Now, the salary on Broadway for ensemble people back then was $125 a week. Big money. Julia <laughs> Prowse paid me $400 a week Ooh, wow. to dance with her. So that's how I started out. And then Amazing. after Juliet Sack closed, I came back to New York. I auditioned for the next thing, which was Sweet Charity, and I got <sighs> it. So that became my relationship with Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon. You were in which, the film of that as well, weren't yes, you? Yes, and I did, was lucky enough to do the film too. So that became that job. Then I left that to go back with Juliet because it paid more money. <laughs> <laughs> but then I stayed in California for about three years on all of the musical variety shows. Uh, Danny Kaye's show, mm -hmm. Brett Skelton's show, Carol Burnett's show, Dean Martin's show, <laughs> all of them. I did all of them and danced with all the star ladies, mm -hmm. Mitzi Gaynor, Sid Charisse, wow. the whole. And that, but that's not what I wanted to do. So I finally just had to stop one day and say, I can't do this anymore. And I went back to school to work on my masters and help them operate a showboat on the river where I got to get back to directing and choreographing plus uh -huh. playing the lead <laughs> to get my roots back. Then I went back to New York and uh, then uh, I was auditioned by Richard Rogers to do Oklahoma at Lincoln Center and mm. I got it. That was mm -hmm. it. And it, it was fascinating because Richard Rogers to me was about, as far as you could go. And uh, at the audition, no pun intended. when I came I in, he was sitting at a table there at Lincoln Center at the New York State Theater. And I got up to audition. I thought, well, I'm going to do a ballad so that he will know I'm really a singer, too, besides being a dancer. So I decided to sing Leonard Bernstein's Lonely Town. Mm. Whoa, I'm heavy. auditioning for Will Parker. <laughs> <laughs> so I got Excellent out about choice. two lines, and this voice said, I don't want to hear you sing that song. You're auditioning for a comedy part. Don't you have a comedy song? And I was told not to sing a Richard Rogers song because he was very particular and that it would not be to my advantage to do one of his songs if I didn't sing it exactly the way he liked it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, Mr. Rogers, I didn't bring a comedy song, but I know Kansas City. Well, why wouldn't you sing that? You sing it in the show. <laughs> I said, I'd love to sing it for you. So I sang two choruses. And he said, can you dance? I said, yes. So he said, show me. <laughs> so I did a routine, a dance routine for him. And I finished. He said, 
is there anything you can't do? I said, no, sir, there isn't. And I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't even read the script. So that began. And of course, my Aunt Eller was Margaret Hamilton, oh, who was wow. a wicked yeah. witch. And so that became a, a lifelong friendship and how lucky I was. Mm -hmm. And that became my doing roles. And then applause happened mm, after so that. Well. And uh, then the friendship with Bacall. Mm -hmm. And then Laura Lye with Carol Channing and everything else followed in line. And the do contact you, was made. You've done so much at this point. Which, what's your favorite thing to do? Be as a performer, as a singer, as a dancer, as a director? All of the above. I, I think it's the, uh, the change. I love everything about it and to be involved in that as long as I can do something. So if I get to a point that I can no longer dance or sing, I could tell everyone else what to do. <laughs> but I, I like just being part of the creative process, and I, I like being with actors and people in the business. And I, I've been very fortunate that during my career that I've had that intimacy with Richard Rogers. Every day I would look at this man and rehearse, and i go, that's Richard Rogers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I got him to sign my score, and I thought, because he was elderly then, and I thought, thank God I got to work with him before he died, I had that experience. Uh -huh. He went on to write three more shows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the reason being, as his daughters have said, the only time our father was ever really happy was when he was working on a show. Wow. And I understand you that. You can understand that, it's I not, understand your, not your life. And the fact to have had the experience of working with Mel Brooks, mm -hmm. and to have had all those great people, all the directors and the choreographers, and then the, the creators of these pieces, to have had that personal relationship, Comden and Green, and you know, Charlie Strauss, and Cy Coleman, and all these giants of the theater. They were friends, and I worked with them. And it, it was funny, once we were out of town with Lorelei, and we were going to a, a soiree after the theater, and Julie Stein dropped by and said, Leroy, uh, you're going to the party? I said, yeah. I said, you have a car? I said, I said, can I ride with you? I said, sure, Julie. And then Comden and Green came, are you going to the party? Can we ride with you? And <laughs> Ernie Flatt, who was then the choreographer, because yeah, so we funny. went through four of them out of town, got in the car, and suddenly I'm driving my car <laughs> with Comden and Green and Julie Stein and, and Ernie Flatt, and we're driving the car, and I tell you what, I slammed on the road and said, wait a minute. <laughs> Look who I have in my car. <laughs> but they were people then to me, and I forgot that. And that was one of the defining moments of my life. I and better not crash this car. <laughs> but that's an interesting point. You have worked with all these great people. Mm. To civilians, they all are people, you know, that, are, that, that stand on a, on a platform. Mm -hmm. But you've worked with them. You've done 10 out of 12s with them. Mm -hmm. Is there a commonality? Is there something that a civilian goes, wow, Richard Rogers or Carol Channing? But you've broken bread with these people. Mm -hmm. How, what does it look like from the inside instead of the outside when you're working with people like well, that? Well, for those of us who are addicted to our jobs mm -hmm. and we're lucky enough to make money doing what we love so mm -hmm. much, we have that common factor. So it's like preaching to the choir. And when you work with great people, mm -hmm. they all have that thing in common. They love the work, and if you love it the way they do, then you, that makes you friends for life. Mm -hmm. And that never changes. And we're all insecure. I know it was interesting with Bob Fosse that uh, one night he was receiving a special award. He had just opened Big Deal on Broadway, mm -hmm. and it was not a hit. Right. And he got the uh, Astaire Award for Best Choreography. And he got up and did his acceptance speech, and he said, I'm a very insecure person. Mm -hmm. I work very hard to do my job, then it's up to the critics to accept it. So I can never become secure because of that. You're always vulnerable. And he said, but the one thing I'm not insecure about is the love I have for my dancers, some of whom are in the audience, and I want to recognize them. Donna McKechnie, Anne Ryan King, oh. and Leroy Rames. Mm -hmm. I cried. Oh, I, my my, the, I could do it now. <laughs> because there was Bob Fosse recognizing me. And, but what it is, it's the love of that. And then having done the film with him of uh, Sweet Charity, uh, then, which, you know, was not that big of a hit. And then he did Cabaret. And I went to see Cabaret before he won the Oscar. And it was just so overwhelming. And I wrote him a letter about how wonderful it was to have seen Cabaret and all this and that. And he wrote a letter back to me. He pecked on a typewriter. That's what he did in those <laughs> days. He, and it was a type, but he signed it at the bottom. He said, 
Dear Leroy, I got your letter today and you made my day mm -hmm. with wow. what you said. He said, as insecure as I am, for one day at least, I felt wonderful. He oh. said, tomorrow I'll go back being <laughs> the <laughs> But for that one day, you and he wrote that. Now, this is Bob Fosse. And the fact that, of course, Cabaret won the Oscar for him How and everything. That? That's why we're all still vulnerable mm -hmm. in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. As powerful as you get, we know what the bottom is. So, yes. You know, a book should be read, it should be written on auditioning. Mm -hmm. Not enough is said about what it takes to get the role. You mentioned the Will Parker, that one is an unusual one, but you know, you have the ones where you fall on your face, mm -hmm. and then others that you get, and you said, you're kidding, I got that role. Mm -hmm. So what are your auditioning stories that you could share with the audience? Well, it, it, I, you know, auditioning is a process you have to do. It's not pleasant. We all mm -hmm. go through the insecurities of wanting to do well. But I find the, the only thing that I keep thinking to myself is not competing. I am there to create. And so when I walk into that audition, although you want everything that you go in for, you have to say, for this moment, I have to look at the room. That's an audience to me. And to do something you're secure about doing, that's, the, the, I think, the best thing to do. So you know what you're going to do now. It's up to you to entertain that group of people. Mm -hmm. And rather than waste your life being nervous, or, ah, can I hit the note, think about what you're going to create. Think about what you're singing and what you believe in so that you can do it so it's not a waste of time in your life. You can't control what they're going to think or do, but you can control what you're thinking and doing. So I use it as a creative experience. So whether you get it or you don't, the only thing you want to do is do well. And many sometimes we do and sometimes we don't do well, and we know it. But it's, it's don't waste the time. Make it a, a good thing. Yeah, that's very and smart. And don't compete. Create. Very smart. Create. Leroy, I had the... Um, the great pleasure of seeing you at the WIC and in La Cage, and you were just amazing. Um, are there some parts that that just stick with you as being your favorite um, parts that you played? Mm, no, or are they all special it, in their own that way? That old adage, and it's very true. Uh, they're like children in the family; <laughs> they all have their special things. And uh, La Cage called upon me to act acting wise and, and carry the show as the star of the show. Gave you that responsibility, and I loved playing that character, but I also love playing Cornelius Hackle <laughs> in Hello, Dolly, because that Going whole back. speech about, mm -hmm. you know, going out seeking adventure in life and about, it doesn't matter that you lose your job, that for one day you had a wonderful day, it's worth, so I got so involved with the philosophy of that show, I, I loved that so much, and Billy Lawler in 42nd mm -hmm. Street didn't require me as an actor to do much as I've just come out and be adorable and <laughs> sing and dance and carry on all In night. But it was a great uh, opportunity to have worked with Gower Champion mm -hmm. because that experience to me was one of the, the best experiences of my life. To be there, to have it created on me, to have had that private time with him. And it's interesting with 42nd Street. Uh, when I found out, Mike Stewart told me during Hello, Dolly, that he was writing a script to 42nd Street. So, bing! I go, ooh, you know, Dick Powell. I could play that part. <laughs> and so I told Mike, I said, you know, I love Dick Powell. And I could have never heard from him for a couple of years after that. But the thing was, then I got the call to come in and audition. And I said, great. And what part is I'm auditioning? They said, you're auditioning for Andy Lee. And I said, is that the Dick Powell? Is <laughs> no, no, they think you're too old for that. They want someone younger. <laughs> oh. So they want you to, Andy Lee is the choreographer in the party. He doesn't really have a solo, but, you know, he has a, and I thought, well, I'm not going to audition. I don't want to do it. And uh, my now husband said back then, why uh, don't you just go in and do what you do and let them see it? <laughs> <laughs> so I took the audition, and I told my accompanist now, when they call me out, in those days we auditioned in theaters, which <laughs> yeah, is a big handicap now that we don't, because that's where you give the performance, not in a small room. And so I walked out, and we started, and I did my up tune, and I said, don't wait for them to ask for the ballad, go right into the ballad. <laughs> and Tony Kay, who happened to be a brilliant dancer, we had just done a show together where I choreographed this big tap dance for us. And I said, and Tony, you come out and we go into this big tap dance. So I put on a performance at that <laughs> audition. Ooh. So when the audition finished, I said there was dead silence. And down the aisle was this gray-haired man walking, it was Gower Champion. 
So I just stood and he went, <laughs> and I went forward and said, yes, sir. He said, you're not right for Andy Lee. I said, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you're very right for Billy Lawler. All right. Yeah. Now, I still didn't get the part. Oh. But I, I assumed that he liked me. Then I got a call from the agent. They want you to come back. And I thought, oh, now it begins. Everybody's getting a call back, so we're all going <laughs> to get up and compete. I came back, and it was just me. And he said, I wanted to see you. I want you to do exactly what you did before, because I'm getting ready to pick Peggy Sawyer. So I want to see the match. So I auditioned again. Still didn't get the offer. <laughs> then I get a call. He thinks that he's found Peggy Sawyer, so come in, and he wants to work with her with you. And I still don't have a contract. My <laughs> agent said, Leroy, you know, Gal was famous for changing his mind at the last minute. You, well, I said, look, I'll take the chance. It's, it's Gower right, champion. Yeah. So I went for two hours, the two dance assistants and the girl who was being auditioned, and we worked, and afterward he said, how did you like her? I said, I liked her very much. When the dance, dance assistant said, well, she's not a great dancer. I said, oh, no, no, no. She was under a lot of pressure. I think she's right for the character. She got the part. Mm -hmm. And then she was doing, her name is Lisa Brown, and she had left a soap opera she was on, and she was in the cast of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Handed in her notices, getting ready to start, and that weekend, Wanda Richard came to the last audition call. And Gower said, she's very good. And the dance assistant said, well, she was in chorus line on the tour, and she said, you're taping never long. He said, well, let's keep her afterward, and maybe she could be the understudy. He read her, changed his mind. Lisa Brown is ready to come in on Monday to sign her contract. She got a call. He changed his mind. Wow. And that was it. Oh. But I got the part. <laughs> <laughs> but then Lisa Brown, the good story is, right. after Wanda left the show, Lisa replaced her, so she got to play. But I yeah. can't let you get past without you were on stage that, open, that famous opening yes. night. What was that like? Well, it's interesting because with Dave and Merrick, mm -hmm. there was so much going on dramatically. We were supposed to have opened the beginning of August because we'd had our out-of-town tryout. And David didn't feel the show was ready. And by this time, Gower was very upset with David, so Gower wasn't coming to rehearsals. And we would do full performances in the theater with full orchestra, full sets, full costumes, one man sitting in the audience, David Merrick. <laughs> huh. And so we did the show for him every night. And one night, the kids brought dolls and teddy bears to put in the front row so we had a noise. <laughs> and Gower, by this time, we heard, had been going into the hospital. But he, he told me at the beginning of rehearsal he had uh, an anemic blood condition. And once in a while, he would have to go in for a blood cleansing. Which, but he looked terrific and was, had energy, so we never thought. So the day of the performance, we were uh, the day of the opening, when finally David said we were going to open, Gower was in the hospital. We knew it. We got a call the day of the opening performance saying, David wants to have a rehearsal at the theater. We had been rehearsing, doing the show every <laughs> night for a month. So, but it was David. So we all went to the theater. Of course, we had limousines ordered. We had so much stuff to do. We all went to the theater. And we were locked in the theater. And we didn't really rehearse. So we do the opening night performance. And of course, at the end, 15 curtain calls. They were just going crazy. The uh, cameras came down the aisle. The flash bulbs are going. We're doing this whole thing buying big, big opening night. And out comes David Merrick. So I assumed he was going to say, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, Gower Champion could be here tonight. And I would like to thank him for giving. I thought that's what he was going to say. And instead, he held up his hands and he said, this was tragic. Well, what's tragic about it? And everybody laughed. And he said, Gower Champion died this afternoon. Well, we all just stood there, and Jerry Orbach, God bless him, was saying, bring in the curtain, bring in the curtain. And the curtain hit the floor. And my first thought was I flashed back to a conversation I had with Gower about the show. And he said, you know, Leroy, during the 70s, I was trying to be with it with the music, and I went to all the discos, and I did the drugs, did, did all the things, and he said, and then one day I woke up and just realized I'm an old-fashioned song and dance man. And when Gower, I mean, when David asked me to do this show, even though my doctor said I wasn't well enough to do it, he mm. said I had to do it because I don't want to be remembered as a has-been. Interesting, yeah. And Whoa. indeed, and that's what wow. I, 
That's what hit me. Then we go to the party. <laughs> and I, I go into the party, because you know it's opening night. We're at the Waldorf Astoria. We only had one producer. We had a sit-down dinner <laughs> with our nameplates. You ever go to an opening night party like that? <laughs> and we had an orchestra. It was so, it was out of a movie. But we're all in like this state of shock. Yeah. And when I walk in, who's the first person I see? Bob Fosse, oh, wow. who came up to me and said, that's SOB. <laughs> he said, I filmed my own death, and he had to do me one better yeah. by actually doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed like we just did, and I said, do you know, Bobby, Gal was up there tonight having a big laugh by what you just said, and how flattered he would be by that. So, I mean, I get, do, we story. could do a whole evening on, on 42nd Street. <laughs> okay. But also, to get back to Hello, Dolly, just that Gawa Champion's work is so meticulous, and having learned the show from him, Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, not from him personally, but having done his concept of it, I understand the workings of it. And it's important to preserve that because I promise you, no one is ever going to do it better than mm -hmm. our champion wow. did it. And that's mm -hmm. what we do with Hello, Dolly. Mm -hmm. We sure. preserve that or rediscover it for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And when you do it again, mm -hmm. and you will do it again, I imagine after the wick, I would like to, but it's going to be the first time that, I mean, I'm sure that there have been people who have done Hello, Dolly, but it's the first time that I think it's been sanctioned with an equity contract. <laughs> now, I'm not sure of that, but I assume it is, and so I will be the first male to do it. But I just want to preserve that concept of Mike Stewart's book and also all the wonderful women who have played it. It's a wonderful part. Come and on. on. And on that Absolutely. note, which I think is a B-flat, probably, <laughs> uh, we are just, we could, honest to God, we could this go. This is the end? We, <laughs> could go we just another scratched them out. Three hours, but unfortunately, the school board will not allow us to do that. <laughs> we want to thank you very much for tuning in. We want to thank Leroy Reams. This has been a gas. <laughs> and we want to particularly thank you for tuning in this week and all our other weeks for watching Spotlight on the Arts. If you'd like to know what's going on in the theater, go to floridatheateronstage.com. We thank you once again for watching, and until the next time, please, go to the theater. Good night. <laughs>